Uh, my name is John Patrick Barry. I uh, you might remember me for being Officer Jones in the video. I uh, was a state trooper for a number of years. I also worked with uh, uh, campus police for uh, a long time, and now I work for the federal government in uh, policing. Um, it is unfortunate, but I uh, I specifically am not allowed to say where I work. <laughs> um, uh, it's it's very weird stuff. Anyway, uh, I guess it's the time that we start seeing it, uh, what kind of questions people have out there. Uh, Jerry, did you uh, introduce yourself? Um, sure, I'm uh, Jerry Weber. I uh, was the legal director for the American Civil Liberties Union of Georgia for a while, and now I'm I have a private practice that I do much of the same, and I'm at the Southern Center for Human Rights doing criminal justice reform and i teach at emory and georgia state law school so i'm kind of okay. all over there. okay so we had this question about uh are, you know are, are police legally allowed to lie to you was there a supreme court uh case about that uh yes there's a whole line of supreme court cases that say that with very narrow limits, police are able to lie lie to you, especially in the interrogation process. Um, and so what they are saying to you, as much as they are trying to be your friend, uh, you cannot trust that. Okay. But it's always uh, always a bad thing to have to, 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 to lie in reverse. Basically should just uh, decline to answer the question. Exactly. You're a question that you don't want to answer. <clears throat> How has um, video recording changed things in terms of today versus 20 years ago? Um, because there's a lot more video recording seemingly everywhere. Um, the police have cameras, but people have cameras in their phones. The camera, it kind of cameras everywhere. Um, does that does that affect? Um, does it put people at risk more, or does it, you know, does it does it uh, help in court? Uh, what's the situation with that? Um, I, I'm happy to address it, or John, if you'd rather, um, I can talk about it too. Oh, 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 well, the thing is, a lot of times when I talk about stuff like this, I think a lot of times it comes across as a virtue signaling, <clears throat> but um, uh, when it comes to court. Um, I, I think it's invaluable on, on, on evidence all, the, all around. Um, something I'm discussing with the department I work with now uh, because there are some, we don't use cameras. Uh, well, we have cameras in our, in our vehicles, but not uh, body cams because uh, there are certain um, uh, HIPAA issues uh, that the uh, organ organization is concerned about. Um, but when it really comes down to it, uh, the the only problem I have with the cameras uh, is is the uh, whenever the police are uh, taken some kind of evidence, there is a long chain of custody. Uh, and if uh, if you guys don't understand chain of custody, it's basically who has had access to that uh, evidence. At what point uh, was there any kind of uh, chance that it was uh, tainted or tampered with uh, versus, um, you know, uh, if I have uh, stuff in my phone, you know, uh, who else has had access to that or have I tried to to uh, uh, tamper with that sort of thing. But it's the idea of um, uh, overall um, uh, transparency at the very least uh but uh otherwise as long as uh you know all the evidence is available uh, i think uh any recording of something that's happened is uh, valuable um evidence okay there's a question about uh, if you're a bystander and you're not you're not part of the um interaction with the police um uh you know what happens if you decide to take video um is it actually even legal to do so it, yes it is i i have uh i've litigated about 10 of these cases now some with 
reporters who are the bystanders, some with citizens who are the bystanders. And it's really clear that as long as you are not interfering with the officers making of the arrest by getting in their space uh, or physically getting in their space, touching them, uh, you have the right to film from a safe distance uh, and the officer may tell you to stop, but you have the First Amendment right not to stop. And the, the comment um, case that I mentioned where we just had the settlement, um, that case talks about our, you know, the right to film in public places and you have an absolute right to do that. Okay. Hey, Jerry. Yeah, uh, and actually, a uniformed police officer performing uh, his or her, her duties uh, while on duty, uh, actually, they do not enjoy um, the uh, any type of like right to privacy sort of situation. There, they they are they are public officials, um, frontline public officials. So uh, you can record them. The only issue that I have, well, not I have, but the only is it, legal issue, as um, uh, Jerry uh, pointed out, is that if you obstruct, an example would be if if they're you're, if they're affecting an arrest and you stand between them uh, or try to stand between them or try to interfere in any way, or even if you're like trying to like record them and kind of stand in their way while they're trying, that that is still obstructing. So that uh, that is something you'll get in trouble for. Is there anything you recommend that someone say to a police officer who asks them or tells them to stop filming them? Uh, I, would, I would just indicate, uh, officer, I have the right under the First Amendment to film you in a public place. I uh, am standing not in your way in conducting this arrest. Uh, if you want me to step a few steps back, I'm happy to do that, but I'm not in your way. So kind of affirming that you are in, not in, involved in the space of the arrest and affirming your right to film. Generally, I would agree with that. Uh, it's also just not a, a sometimes not a great idea just to say too much but the fact that you actually recording sometimes is actually a good idea to say that you said some say something that and you recorded it say but that also is on you how you react to that um you know if uh, uh you have to you also have to be careful about yourself that you don't commit some other crime outside of that while you're while you're recording because if you actually start making a spectacle of yourself, you know, and people are driving by and they, they're looking at you and not you know, necessarily what's going on with the police, but suddenly you become the spectacle, you might actually, you might satisfy the uh, elements of disturbance of the peace or disorderly conduct, depending on the level of spectacle you've created for yourself. But yeah, as long as you are uh, calm and you say something to the effect of, hey, uh, I am over here. You should know that I have a right to uh, record this um, since you are a public official on duty. <clears throat> yeah, and the only other thing I'd add is uh, you obviously can't get in the street and be filming because then you're blocking a roadway. You need to be careful of where you are at beyond the proximity of the officer. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to go into the idea of qualified immunity, uh, Scott, unless we've missed some questions from chat so far. Uh, no, let's go ahead with that. All right. Again, I'm sorry for having been away. I've changed browsers and it's working much better now. Uh, Jerry, both you and John have some pretty nuanced views on qualified immunity, which has gotten a lot of news recently. And Jerry, your case had some great... Uh, had a great look at it as well. Would you like to start talking about a little over that case and qualified immunity? And I'd love to hear John's thoughts as well. Sure. So, so qualified immunity, what it means is that you can't sue a government official, even if they violated the Constitution, if their constitutional violation was in the gray area of the law. So you have to have pretty clear prior cases that show that it was a black and white constitutional violation and not a iffy kind of gray thing. And uh, so what that means is that uh, government officials, and it's not just police officers, it's teachers, it's all kinds of government officials, may violate your constitutional rights, but qualified immunity would protect them. Um, to give you one kind of horrific example, I had an entire class of kids that was strip searched by 
a police officer and a teacher to recover $26 that was missing from their class. The entire class strip searched. And um, all of the courts said constitutional violation, but the law was gray. And so my clients got no relief. And so it's a, it's a doctrine that has become a bar to protecting constitutional rights. And that's why persons on kind of all parts of the political spectrum, some very conservative judges and commentators and some very liberal uh, commentators and, and judges have called for the reevaluation of it. I would like to say that um, uh, I think the problem with uh, the idea of stripping qualified immunity is because people have a misconception behind it. Um, they uh, a lot of times they hear the word immunity uh, because they it's probably said something that uh, it's probably something they've heard on television, uh, and uh, they think that oh well that means that they have carte blanche and that's not true. Uh, qualified immunity is especially when the police are concerned. Um, it means that yes, uh, you cannot be sued provided there are three things that you haven't violated. If you haven't violated the law, policy, or your training, okay. Uh, sometimes people are like going, "Oh, well, you know, they can do whatever they want," and then you know, the the we can't sue them personally. We can actually sue the the department. But we can't sue them. That, see, that's not true. If the officer even uh, went outside of their training, if the officer broke the, their own policy within that department, which a uh, short little side note on that, um, every department, uh, every different department has their own different policy. All right. There are certain laws that govern uh, a lot of police policy, but each department has its own particular policy. Uh, there's sometimes there's some standardizations or some best practices, but generally speaking, you're dealing with a, if you're dealing with Baltimore City Police, you're dealing with Baltimore City Police policies. If you're dealing with, uh, you know, Aurora Police, you're dealing with Aurora Police's policies. Um, and not to say that they don't, they don't have policies that are in common with one another, but each department uh, should have had some sort of legal counsel review their policies to make sure that, you know, everything is uh, uh, copacetic. But uh, again, if they violated the law, if they violated their policy, or if they violated um, their training or any combination thereof, then uh, qualified immunity doesn't apply. You can sue them. There is something called professional liability insurance that uh, any cop worth their salt should carry that um and usually the the upper limits of a uh, typical uh, policy is about two million dollars uh, so uh just so you guys are aware i'm not saying hey just sue everybody and go after them for two million dollars i'm just letting you know that those policies would not exist uh if what i say that with the insurance policies wouldn't exist if you couldn't actually um sue the officer personally yeah, and most of the cities and counties actually indemnify their officers. So the officers don't need their own insurance policy. The city or county will pay if the officer is found to be liable. Even if the officer is found to have been outside of policy, law, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I, I disagree with John a little bit because qualified immunity requires a constitutional violation, too. So in order to get damages, you both have to show a clear constitutional violation. And sometimes part of the evidence of that is, is that the officer violated policy or training. But um, just violating policy or training, if there's no constitutional violation, no damages against the officer. Hmm. Fascinating. It's interesting looking, uh, reading, br skimming through the brief you sent from uh, Fort Valley and the look there at qualified immunity. So I hope we'll get that shared because it is a it is pretty interesting looking at a pretty hot yeah. topic. Yeah, it's an interesting case. I mean, it's a guy who was going through the city of Fort Valley. He was a blogger and he had a camera on and uh, they decided he was a suspicious person is what they said. And they asked him to identify himself. He, he said he would not do that. And then they arrested him uh, for disorderly conduct 
the notion that he was violating the police's orders, but he had every right to do what he did. He filmed everything. The officer also had body cam image that, that confirmed it. And, uh, and what I sent around is kind of the First Amendment and Fourth Amendment rights in those situations. That's what the judge wrote the opinion about. And it's interesting because Georgia police have told me in the past that they will generally charge, if someone will not positively identify themselves, they're more likely to charge with loitering or trespass. Yeah, so, and that may be other charges that happen in other cases. That makes sense. Okay, interesting. Uh, John, I'm just curious, what was your training regarding people who do or don't identify themselves? I understand Maryland's obviously a different jurisdiction. Hmm. Um, generally speaking, uh, if, uh, uh, well, uh, three different uh, uh, entities, <laughs> so uh, three different training. But uh, generally speaking, um, first of all, there has to be a reasonable articulate suspicion um, at the very least, at the very least. Now, I, I, I know we're throwing out maybe some legal terms people aren't familiar with, but on like the very, very level, you have something called mere suspicion. Now, mere suspicion, that's not, not enough to really do anything. The, the police are allowed to have a consensual conversation with you at that point. Uh, they can come up and say, hey, how you doing today? And if you're not doing anything wrong, you can tell them to pound sand. <laughs> now it's not a matter of like uh you know am i doing anything wrong you want to sit there you know question you can you can engage if you want to but you don't have to if they if you know if if their their level is only mere suspicion the problem is it you can't necessarily judge what they think that they have at the time so that's something else you know that can be lead to misunderstanding above mere suspicion is going to be reasonable articulate suspicion of which they uh, actually have the authority to detain you at that point. And during that time, yeah, generally they want to get uh, your, identi your identification. Um, uh, at least uh, make sure you're, you're not a wanted criminal or something of that effect. But then above that, of course, is probable cause. And probable cause is the minimum uh, evidence that a police officer needs to uh, uh, effect an arrest um, or even to uh, effect a, a, a search or even act for a search uh, from a judge for a search warrant. Um, and then the, the other levels, you know, are, are levels that are discussed in, of evidence are discussed in court um, uh, when it comes to, uh, well, do they have, when you might hear the phrase um, uh, uh, beyond reasonable doubt. Yeah, that's much higher standard uh, in court. Yeah, thanks for sharing those breakdowns. And that's uh, part of why the movie stresses that if police officers are asking for permission to search, they probably do not have probable cause to search at that moment. Correct. Uh, generally, most departmental policies um, will already have written in there specifically that uh, they don't, that um, just so you guys are aware, you guys need at very least reasonable articulate suspicion to even ask. Um, there was a, a guy that was training. Um, actually, I was just his sergeant. He had a training officer. Uh, he made a, a stop. Uh, this was a couple years back. Um, and it was blatantly an unconstitutional stop. And uh, I actually <laughs> actually even encouraged uh, the, uh, the victim in that situation to, to, uh, to go ahead and, and seek recourse. For that because when i looked at it i was like no guy was just out for a late night walk you know <laughs> so you know just because someone's out walking late at night that's not even close to reasonable articulate suspicion yeah good breakdown on the levels thank you very much john another area we often get asked at dragon con when we're live is on weapons and the most common area people want to know about is kind of the rule of thumb about within easy reach and the like. So almost every year we'll get asked, at what point should I tell the police officer who has stopped me that I have a legal firearm that I'm licensed to carry, concealable or whatever, either on my person or in the car? And I'd love to get your opinions both on the legal perspective and what a police officer would feel safest hearing. 
Maybe John. John you want... oh, go ahead, Jerry. Yeah, let me start, John. I think you probably have more experience with this issue than I do. Oh, okay. I just, I did a lot of talking, so I figured I'd see if you wanted to talk next. But um, well, uh, and you could probably, as from a legal perspective, can explain Terry versus Ohio better than I can. Uh, but when it comes to actually somebody just saying to them, so saying, "Hey, I I have a legal a firearm," and you know, in the South, uh, the the laws tend to be a little more. Um, uh, little less stringent than places like i live in california now for example um the laws are are much different than they would be uh if if i were in alabama or uh, georgia um but uh if you have if you're legally carrying a firearm uh one of the best things for you to do is make sure you put your hands someplace where generally speaking uh a reasonable person would believe that you're not going for that firearm you know um you, you might be you might you know verbalize to say officer to see you're aware i have a firearm on me which is legal make sure you let them know that you have a you know concealed carry permit or something of that effect yes i, I know someone uh some may um uh point out uh, the philando castle um uh, situation. Uh, I have some opinion on that. I think the guy was wrong uh, in, in, in the shoot, you know. Um, but then again, it wasn't there. I've only seen the videos. Um, I, I don't like, I, I know it's terrible when people keep saying, why well, well, I wasn't there. That's a, uh, but I mean, there is some re reality there that uh, the the courts have even ruled that you can't that they're not allowed to you know sit back and view it from the from an armchair uh, uh, perspective. They actually have to view it from the officer's officer's perspective at the time. Yeah, and and I agree with 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 all of that. I I think the most important thing is if you have a carry permit, you are doing nothing wrong, but you need to protect yourself. And so what that means is that you calmly tell the officer, you make sure that your hands are not anywhere near the firearm. You tell them where the firearm is and where your permit is. You do not reach for your wallet. You do not reach for your firearm. You let the officer do it. Um, if you have a firearm on you and you do not have a carry permit and you are not supposed to be carrying the firearm, it is more safe to you to disclose that to the officer, I think, just as a practical matter, than to uh, attempt to hide that from the officer um, because it may lead to a, a, a potentially deadly situation. So, you know, when a firearm's involved, it's really safety first. And, it's, you know, if, if you have the, the permit, you've done nothing wrong. You just need to make sure that the officer knows all that and that you do not make any moves that, that create a dangerous situation i'd also point out uh, uh that uh knives and other types of weapons that are dang yeah, uh, sure. dangerous and uh don't misunderstand me uh um my grandfather taught me to always have uh, some sort of cutting edge with me just in case you know uh the joke there's always a joke out there well what if there's cake you know <laughs> so uh but no it, my grandfather always said make sure you have a uh, some sort of cutting edge with you um and uh the thing is a knife is a deadly weapon there is no question about that uh it, look up your municipality and your state laws to make sure you know that the the type of knife you're allowed to carry and it looks like you guys lost me i don't know how but it you're still there oh, okay you're here by audio my computer yeah. oh, okay um yeah so, video uh, pros audio is great let them know that you that if, if you're if you have a knife on you provided that what you have you know it's like hey it's down there in my pocket you know so man the movie star looking one is dropped <laughs> from the screen at least we can still hear him uh and that's great information i really appreciate that and uh, i think it's always important to remind people at this presentation that this isn't about how to break the law, it's how to protect your rights, but even more <laughs> importantly, to keep these situations from escalating. So you'll see in my uh, list at the beginning, that is our number one goal of you watching this, is to learn how to keep these from escalating and 
to how to protect your rights in these situations. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I uh, definitely appreciate that. And uh, Terry versus Ohio is an interesting one to talk a little bit about. Um, I think we've addressed the, some of the major points of safety. Um, either of you want to go into into Terry and that for the standards for our viewers? Sure. The I mean, the simplest version of it is if there is reason for the officer to believe that you may have a weapon, they can do a non-intrusive search of the place where they believe the weapon is to determine whether there is a weapon. That doesn't mean that they can search your whole person. That doesn't mean they can search your bag. Uh, it means that they can conduct a limited search to just avert what they perceive to be the danger and they have to have a basis for perceiving that there was a danger so it's 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 a it's a very narrow kind of search that they're allowed in those and, circumstances and terry searches don't mean they can look in your trunk or anything like that no nope, uh, no nope, nope. correct me if i'm wrong my understanding is it's something you could easily reach that's correct standard. which means it doesn't necessarily have to be on your body but something you could easily grab that's correct so you'll hear about Terry searches often, and this is one of the times that a police officer can pat you down, even if you don't consent to a search. But if they find something else, what happens to it? What is uh, they? They have to be able to. That that officer has to be able to articulate. Uh, you know, and I would you hear that in the business a lot. They have to be able to articulate it, um, and I say it in that kind of mocking tone because. A lot of times uh, trainers will say you just have to be able to articulate it, but they don't say what they mean by that, which is kind of annoying to me. But basically, um, if they're patting somebody down and they find and, and say, for example, they have a, a pipe or something uh, in their in their back pocket, um, the, they have to be able they have to be able to articulate that they have knowledge, training and experience in identifying that sort of thing. Um, just by you know, it's a, the the law. I mean, the um, the case law specifically says that you you have to be able to identify it pretty much the second you put your hand on it, uh, as opposed to going, oh, hmm, let me see that 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 feels like a pipe, you know, it's like going pipe, you know, or to be able, or if they're if um, if they are patting you down for something, and for some reason. They had every reason to believe that it was an actual weapon, and it ends up being some other type of contraband. Then that also uh, becomes an issue. All right, let's talk about some of the other search issues that we deal with. For instance, the plain view rule. Uh, basically, if a police officers can see something, that gives them cause. Some of you want one of you want to go into a little bit more depth about what the plain view rule covers. Because it's not just sight, right? Well, yeah, it it uh, it it can be more than that. Um, it's I'm I'm dealing with a case right now where 65 people at a party were arrested uh, when a half an ounce of marijuana was found in the in the place where they were having a party, um, and the officers claimed that they had plain view from the outside both by smelling the marijuana from their closed window vehicles and by viewing it through the windows, even though it was a half an ounce of marijuana and there were 65 people at the party. So uh, that's a, an example of how officers may sometimes kind try to stretch plain view uh, much farther than what the law says, which is that uh, there has to be an articulable reason um, for uh, that, that you have seen it visually or that you have um, through other senses uh, experienced it. Um, and uh, it's not a carte blanche and it's a pretty narrow exception. And John, what are police officers taught about the plain view rule? Uh, a lot of times because we're such a visually oriented society, they say if, if you can actually see it, from where you're standing or you know a reasonable person could see it from a very easy perspective um then that, but at the same time what they're not told obviously or that they're not trained well I sh in my opinion is that it's all it's all of your senses 
An example is if I'm walking, if I'm walking around and I hear things that are gunshots, you know, everybody can hear them. <laughs> That's that also qualifies as plain view in that situation. Um, and yeah, if uh, officers are trained in what uh, marijuana smells like, but not that many people need to be trained in it necessarily, but they are actually trained in that. Um, you know, uh, just as a little strange little anecdote, uh, point of fact, uh, one of the reasons that I think that marijuana is really not that bad for people is that so many departments will actually ha they have these exposure uh, classes with you to make sure that you uh, you can testify in court. It's like, oh, yeah, we went to this class and we were exposed to it so we could, you know, understand what it smells like. Well, um, there are some tablets sometimes that they burn that, you know, supposedly are not marijuana, but some departments actually will use the real thing. So if they're exposing officers to this intentionally, there's a pretty good chance that there are no long-term effects. <laughs> the most popular training session there. <laughs> so, Nobody uh, that's just a small little anecdote about that. But, um, but yeah, uh, any time that the, the five sen senses can, uh, one of the five senses can blatantly detect something um, that pretty much anybody around could detect, whether it's, you know, sight, sound, you feel it, I mean, taste it. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. Excellent. And this is why we recommend to people watching this session that if you have anything that can be misconstrued, if you are involved in alternative sexual lifestyles, keep your play bag in your trunk. A police officer will have lots of reason to think that's a rape kit if they see it. If you are costuming as a cowgirl and you have six shooters, better off in the trunk, better off out of uh, plain sight. If you're throwing a alternative uh, lifestyle sexuality party at home, have someone monitor the front door to make and don't have weird activities going on within view of the window. If a police officer might construe that as assault, there comes a point when they're kind of obligated to come in if you're doing things and so make sure someone's watching the back door, not to let folks in through the back door. I have a single point of entrance. If you're afraid that what you're what legal activities you're doing would be misconstrued. All right. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the process of what police have to go through to search a house. In the film, they did talk about um, the uh, when they see a clear and present danger, and then they can come on in. What is the standard for clear and present danger? Can you explain what that really means? And if they need a search warrant, how do they go about doing that? John, why don't you, you start? Want to... <laughs> uh, sure. All right. Uh... Yeah. Uh, he just wants the advantage. I get it. Um, uh, so basically, uh, when it comes to exigency, the exigent circumstances, um, there has to be something that, like somebody screaming, help, 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 or something of that effect, or like maybe uh, signs of forced entry, or maybe even like, a, you know, blood someplace uh, that you can tell is very recent. Um, uh, it, it, I think, uh, Hollywood likes to, you know, kind of overuse, uh, the, the exigent circumstance, um, uh, situation, but it really has to come down to that somebody's, uh, in peril of their life or a serious injury or something of that effect. Yeah. And the only addition that I would, I unfortunately have to add to that is the, uh, destruction of evidence. Sometimes they will assert mm, yeah. that in circumstance, but they have to have a, a again, an art articulable basis for their belief that the evidence is about to be destroyed, which is um, uh, a pretty high burden for the officer to show. And, you know, that's the kind of issue that, you know, it's something that, that the, the lawyers and their clients fight about afterwards. But the main thing is that you do not give them consent to enter the house. And so they have to either get the warrant or they have to argue, the police have to argue that one of these exceptions to the warrant requirement apply, which is, you know, a, a burden that's put on them. Yeah, that's a great point from Jerry is that if you haven't consented, your lawyer can make a motion to suppress evidence that is picked up. And even if there's a search warrant, they can challenge the legality of the search warrant 
and get that way get any evidence suppressed via motions. When we talk about these various legal uh, levels with, you have, with which you can deal, there's no one silver bullet that will keep you out of jail or keep you from getting convicted. These are all layers of defense. You're building layers like a classic medieval castle, one layer after another, uh, and you will, your lawyer will raise these in court in your behalf and in order to, uh, well, keep you safe from, a, from an uh, incorrect conviction. So each one of these is important to, uh, to include. Uh, Jerry, do you want to talk a little bit about how a lawyer handles it? What, what, what a lawyer needs to see in order to uh, apply for evidence to be suppressed? What would your perfect client have done? Well, your perfect client has kind of done what we all saw on the video. Uh, they have not divulged statements. They have not given statements that they shouldn't have given to the police officer. They have asked to see a lawyer. They have not consented to anything. Um, the identification, that's kind of a side issue, but um, you have to have asserted all your rights to preserve them. And if it becomes gray in terms of whether you consented or not, then uh, that makes it harder for the lawyer to defend you. Uh, so the clear evidence is the most important thing. Um, and uh, also being straight with your lawyer uh, about exactly what happened. Um, honesty from a client is, is critical to uh, helping the client. Excellent. All right. And since this is the EFF track, let's start talking a little bit about electronics and devices. So ability of police to search phones, computers, etc., has gotten a lot of attention recently. Um, I don't think we'll go into the searches at customs areas of your computer, since I think that's still being hammered out, unless I've missed a case. And Scott will let us know if there's something new there. But let's talk specifically about phones. When can police search your phone? Well, in general, they need a warrant unless it's a search incident to an arrest. And even then, I think there are limitations on how much they can look in, at your phone at that point. So um, you do not give the officer the passcode to get into your phone ever. Uh, you ask to see a lawyer and you do not give that information to an officer ever. Um, they may get a warrant and get that information, but you, your first words out of your mouth when they take your phone is, I don't consent to you taking my phone and I'm not going to give you the passcode and I'd like to see a lawyer. What if your passcode is your fingerprint? You cannot, especially in Georgia, because Georgia actually has a separate sort of line under the state constitution about that. But uh, you, they cannot force you to put your finger on, their, on the phone. Is that true nationally or just Georgia? Uh, well, it's, it's true nationally, I think, uh, but it's particularly true in Georgia because there's a, um, what's called a non-testimonial self-incrimination where they can't make you sign your name on a piece of paper nor can they make you provide your fingerprint on your phone. Very good to know. John, what are police taught about uh, getting access to phones? Uh, generally, uh, you need a warrant. Um, and uh, uh, there's a guy right now um, who uh, he's actually on a suspension <clears throat> uh, because uh, for a few reasons, but one of which is that uh, he, uh, he recently um, asked for consent uh, for someone who is in custody. Now, uh, case law says he's allowed to ask that, but policy says he wasn't. So <laughs> uh, policy was more stringent in, the case, uh, in that situation. And uh, he broke policy by saying, no, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to ask for her for her consent. You know, she's got handcuffs on her. She's in the back of his, uh, of his patrol vehicle, and it's like going, um, no, can't do that. You know, I wasn't there for that. Uh, the uh, one of my former um, uh, co-workers was with that individual when that happened. And it's like, no, 
you know, not, not as far as policy is concerned, even though the court says you're allowed to ask. But generally speaking, you know, don't give consent. You know, um, even if you have nothing to hide, you know, uh, giving consent is, is a, a form of self-incrimination. And that's quite clear that you have a right against self-incrimination. And, and you're potentially opening up your all the contents of your phone, which is, you know, in incredible um, to the officer's search. And the one other thing I was going to mention is that I've had some cases where officers who did get access to a phone have attempted to dele de delete the images uh, that somebody took of the arrest. And that is actually a separate violation of a, a federal statute. Um, and um, that's a, a separate offense. Uh, and in some places, including the city of Atlanta, as one example, if an officer deletes an image on someone's phone, that is a dismissible offense. That that the sanction for that by the department is dismissal. Interesting, interesting. Uh, speaking of self-incrimination, one topic I forgot to deal with when we're talking about IDs is implied consent. In Georgia and other places, when you drive, when you use the public highways, you have given implied consent for police officers to ask for your ID uh, and to give you DUI tests if they suspect that you're driving under the influence. Uh, and um, if you refuse, you lose the right to drive essentially for a year. Uh, either of you want to talk about uh, the implied consent doctrine a little more? detail and how people can handle uh, these situations when they don't want to give over a ID or take a, a DUI test? Generally speaking, every state that you have, uh, uh, that you reside in, uh, they are permitted to, uh, uh, to regulate uh, your right to drive in them. Um, and so that falls under <clears throat> usually a DMV or whatever uh, entity you have to cover that sort of thing. But they have a right to regulate that, you know, and because that is a privilege, that's not necessarily a right. So uh, that's a revocable, uh, revocable privilege. That's that if you uh, you can get stopped for violating those laws, and uh, yeah, you at that point, yeah, you have to furnish some kind of proof that you are a licensed driver at that point. Uh, when it comes to DUIs, same situation. If you fail to give consent, because like I said, they're allowed, that state is allowed to regulate your driving. Um, if, uh, if you fail to, uh, uh, to, to uh, participate or uh, in the tests that uh, you're offered, um, they're allowed to say, well, if you're not willing to even give us a chance, chance to figure out if you're good enough to drive well then we're not going to let you so yeah and it can also create a a presumption that you were intoxicated if you refuse uh in some states actually is that true in georgia i didn't think that was true in georgia i don't know if it's true in georgia it's true in some states yeah. all right our last question we have from mkh going back to phones what about face id if the officer holds the phone up to your face and it unlocks I don't know if there's any cases on it. I I, uh, I would think, and this is kind of what I said before about Georgia, I think that they couldn't do that in Georgia. Um, I would imagine that the case law is going to develop, and it's very new, that officers cannot do that, uh, that they have to seek a warrant. And uh, my suggestion, I guess, in the meantime, until the case law develops, is if an officer tries to do that, um, you know, I would affirmatively be saying at that moment, uh, I do not consent to this. Uh, I do not consent to my my the face ID being used to open my phone. And I ask, I, I believe that you need a warrant to access my phone. John, have you ever been taught anything about using a face ID on phones? Not about that, but I would say generally that falls back on the self-incrimination. Um, you know, you have a right to not self-incriminate. So, if, you know, if they... And on top of that, that uh, as the best thing to do is, in my opinion, is not even use that feature. You know, if you don't, <laughs> until yeah, no. something actually can cover you that, if 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 that, because you have to actually like, yeah, make sure that that feature works. If you just if you just don't even put that feature as an availability, then they can't do it. So, 
Um, I know that some that some people well that's that's breaking into my freedom, but you know it's also protecting you on something that's going to take you what you know another second for you to put your thumb on your thing or another second to type in your actual uh, code to protect yourself. I would just skip using that feature personally. MKH thinks it doesn't work if your eyes are closed. So. Uh... Yeah, but we keep our eyes open in this society, in a true democratic society. All right. Um, I really want to thank everyone for having joined us today. Always a, a great discussion. Great to have people like uh, Jerry Weber and J.P. Barry who have such great views on this. I don't consider them on opposite sides of this at all. At all. Both of them are very much focused on upholding the laws and ensuring that everyone has the most positive experience with it they can have. So I appreciate the, both of them. Being on it. Any parting words from any of our panelists? The only thing I was going to say is, and we didn't talk about this, but if an officer has done something wrong, you have the right to file a complaint with the Internal Affairs or Office of Professional Standards, or some uh, cities or counties have uh, citizen review boards as well. And so uh, do that. Uh, it is one way of making uh, police accountable. JP, final word. Generally the, the thing is with, uh, and this is just coming from me, once again, it's going to sound like virtue signaling, so my apologies. But uh, when I took my oath, everywhere I took my oath, I took one of the first places I took was to the Constitution. And uh, the Constitution, if, if I'm swearing to the Constitution, that means I have to uphold those things. And uh, which is why uh, your rights, your civil rights and liberties are very important. Um, not just to you, but they should be just as to me as they, they are to you. So we are peace officers. We're there to maintain the peace, which means I'm, just, I'm the one who's supposed to be the grown-up when I show up to those situations, uh, no matter how uh, childlike or out of control people are. Um, and I am the one who is to hold my peace in that. And uh, what gets me nowadays is that there are a lot of officers who uh, get on the job and, you know, it's it's either a power trip or whatever the uh, case may be. Um, and please understand that uh, there are uh, people who are out there trying. They're trying hard to get the people out there uh, who are on the job, who shouldn't be on the job, and trying to get them removed. And it's not an easy process. And um, some people are like, well, it should be an easy process. Well, it's not always an easy process. Um, you know, just because if you, find, if you find something wrong with them and, they've, and they haven't gotten rid of them, yeah, then that's a problem. You know, but uh, they have to do something wrong first. And once they do something wrong, yeah, you know, they shouldn't do that job anymore. Uh, and it's not just me trying to put it. I put in paper against five different people. Um, and, uh, you know, there are those of us who are out here trying. It's not just what uh, everyone seems to think that that thin blue line, nobody is willing to do anything about it. But, you know, I'd rather have people out there who are doing the correct and proper thing with me um, and then somebody who is going to risk uh, not only my job but maybe even my safety so excellent great thoughts and uh, part of the reason why we, why we are able to always get law enforcement officials to join this panel thank you all for joining us and now you all have to repeat one more time first of all i do not consent to any searches all right, that's pretty do good. Not not have... any <laughs> I do not consent to any searches. <laughs> the second one, am I being detained or am I free to go? Am I All being right, detained or am I free to go? Next one, um, uh, I'm afraid I can't let you in without a warrant. I'm afraid I can't let you, let you in without a warrant. Oh, dang it. What was the fourth one? Uh, I should have had my notes set up. I, I won't talk. I want a lawyer. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Uh, now I've got to repeat it because I can't believe as many times I've done this, it didn't jump right to mind. I'm going to remain silent. I would like to have an. Uh, I would like to see. I'd like to have access to my lawyer. Now. I'm going to remain silent. I'd like to have access to my lawyer. <laughs> now I think actually the time statement is an important thing, but that's for next year. Come back next year, and we'll talk about when you get to see your lawyer. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Thanks.